Hey everyone, welcome back to the Questioning Behavior Podcast. And today we once more have an episode for you where we talk to someone who has just started out in behavioral science. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All you and when we say science. just started out, we mean has already got a PhD, has gone through that entire process and is now making their way into the field. So I'm very excited about this. I know Sarah is very excited about this and hopefully our guest, Andreas is also very excited about this, hopefully, at least. I mean, he has to be here for a solo amount of time. So to get all of us properly acquainted, Andreas, would you mind telling the crowd who you are, what you do, and how did you get there? Yes, thanks. So my name is Andreas. I have a, I have a PhD in behavioral science, and specifically with the focus on policy development. And I am now working as a chief advisor and specialist in consumer behavior in the Danish Competition and Consumer Authority. And I have for three years after I finished my PhD. All right, Mm -hmm. cool. So moving from policy and then essentially, well, I mean, staying in policy because the authority there is is still a, a government body, I presume. Sure. It is, right? Okay, cool, cool. So taking a few steps back, Why do a PhD in applying behavioral science to policy? Because there was not a lot of people doing that. Uh, So there was a lot of people doing behavioral science when I started out my PhD. I I had been working in the field before that. I had dabbled in behavioral science in my master's as well. Mm -hmm. But I guess I, I saw that we have we have all these all this research and all these insights coming out, but I I still thought back then that the the implementation from research to actual policy was kind of clunky mm-hmm. and that the way the system we've made for, for policymaking is so based on traditional economics and traditional legal thinking that we could all benefit if someone looked at how, how those systems are affected when you sort of incorporate behavioral insights or behavioral science results into your, your catalog of ways of doing stuff. So, so that's why I, I focused on that. And then I focused specifically mm-hmm. on consumer science, uh, consumer policy, because I thought that that's where the biggest, that's that's the that's the most uh, complicated field because you have so many, there's so much at stake all the time, right? For for business, mm-hmm. for, for policymakers, mm-hmm. for consumers. So, so that's what I I did in my PhD, and that's what I've continued doing in my job afterwards. That's super interesting. It's kind of cool how you can go and do a PhD that sort of almost directly lends itself to a career in policy. Because in my mind, it's sort of almost like two separate things. You sort of, you know, the PhDs, the academics are generating the knowledge Mm -hmm. and the policymakers are the ones applying it. But is that line really fuzzy for you and your career? How much of what sort of the generating of the knowledge do you do yourself, you know, sort of within your role in policy? Mm. I think you're right in most cases, but I also think... So I think it takes the right kind of organization afterwards to recognize the value of having someone who has this research background and who's able to sort of go through that process of generating knowledge and integrating it. And the flip side of that is that you can design the research much more yourself. You're not reliant on you know stubborn academics who are, who are pursuing you know that special experiment they want to do and which is completely unapplicable to the policy situation uh, you're currently in, right? So so you get a lot of flexibility, but you have to accommodate as an organization this type of work, which is very different from traditional policy development. So we generate generate insights, we generate knowledge, and then we try to build policy on those results. And that process is, it goes both ways. So we also look at what types of problems to work with based on what, what the policy agendas currently are, right? So there's sort of a nice feedback loop. We are at the forefront of the policy, but we're also generating knowledge that fits right, you know, hand in glove with the policy question that's, you know, that the organization is working on. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So then a a more practical question, when going into the PhD program, knowing that you want to focus on the behavioral science applications to policy, Did you design your PhD in such a way that you were almost exclusively focusing on the policy issues that were at play Mm. at the time to maybe smoothen your way into a (laughs) non-academic career? It would have been very practical. It would have been very clever. I'm just wondering. I I was not that that? clever. No. (laughs) Ah. I'm sorry. (laughs) That would have been smart. But uh, unfortunately, 
my PhD looked, uh, I, lo I think I looked at some problems. So I looked at, you know, the ethical application of behavioral insights as a policymaker. That's one area. And I mean, that's not very time relevant. It's, it's sort of something that's always a problem and it's never been dealt with. It, it wasn't a policy area or an agenda that was raising a lot of political awareness. So it weren't really, mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't really advantageous in that regard. And then I looked at behavioral market failures, sort of updating the traditional way of thinking about market failures in light of behavioral insights. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't something, there wasn't exactly organizational demand for that type of research. And then I did a couple of, um, of applications of experiments, something with price sensitivity and something with complaint handling, which was much more, I think the complaint handling was much more plug and play for the organization to continue working on and integrating the, those results. Uh, but that was basically the only experiment that sort of made sense for my current employment. And then it's also important to say that my original background in my master's is from philosophy. So, so I have a very oh. different way of thinking about these types of systems and I'm I'm more trained to think about more abstract problems than the, the organization is currently working on. So behavioral market failures is a very abstract way of working with the traditional market failures literature and looking at how that evolves in light of you know research from behavioral science. But it's not something that a policymaker wakes up and says, let's update you know the entire way of thinking about market failure. So that's more something I'm working on to convincing from the inside out of the organization afterwards that this is a way of working with market mm -hmm. failures and it's something we should be more aware of and dedicate more resources to. So I, I definitely had some convincing to do afterwards that this is something the organization should be doing. It wasn't probably mm -hmm. immediately obvious for them, you know, <laughs> to integrate all my research. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. All right. So, I mean, you, you've now mentioned philosophy. M maybe let's backtrack a bit more. So explain to me how a philosopher <laughs> rolls into behavioral science, decides to do a PhD in behavioral science, and then goes off the academic trajectory into applied yeah. policy. I, I feel like there's a couple mm. steps there that need some filling in for me. <laughs> That's a very simple explanation, oh. which is called demand. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so the demand for philosophers is not very high. And the uh -huh. demand for behavioral scientists was, it was, and it keeps on being very high, right? So, mm -hmm. but I did, my master's in philosophy was very focused on the philosophy of mind and on co cool. cognition, mm -hmm. on epistemology, which sort of, in a weird way, it overlaps with many of the, you could say, very theoretical underpinnings of some of the behavioral science stuff coming out mm -hmm. from for instance, Kahneman or other uh, early behavioral scientists, there's, there's a much larger overlap of philosophy and, and psychology than you would think in the early behavioral science stuff, because it, it, that's typically the case, right? When you want to sort of challenge a paradigm, you, then you, you need to get on the very abstract level of working and thing, and philosophy is sort of very abstract, so it's, it's always there. Oh. <laughs> and I did that, and... And that's right about when this whole nudge craze started happening. So there's mm -hmm. a very high demand for people who understood the theory and understood sort of the, the application of these types of theories to real life. And mm -hmm. I've always worked, even though I'm from philosophy, I've never really liked the armchair philosopher meme. I've okay. always worked with you know <laughs> practical problems and practical applications of philosophy. And I saw that as a, you know, this makes sense to me. And people want to know about it and i want to tell about it so uh, i sort of transitioned into more and more applications and more and more practicalities of behavioral science and less and less about the you know the hardcore abstract theoretical underpinnings and then when the, when the time came to sort of move on academically i saw a need for this integration with political thinking and there's a lot of theory building in political philosophy as well mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I had a sort of a, the, I guess, academic equipment to work with it. And I just decided this is a really practical and exciting thing to work on. And, and luckily people agreed and, and I was allowed to do the, the PhD. And then, okay. yeah, and then afterwards move on to actually working with it in, in, in the authority. Yeah, that's super interesting.
Yeah, it's absolutely interesting, but I I need more practical steps yeah, yeah, yeah. here, Andreas. Like the so, some of the audience here is is probably still considering like, am I going to do a PhD? Is it worth it? And if I don't have a background in psych economics and the hmm. traditional fields, you know, you said yourself you did a master's in philosophy. Mm-hmm. Did you do the PhD immediately after? Mm. Was there a no. career in between? Yeah. How did you transition from one to the other? And who did you have to convince to do a PhD? Yeah, that's a great question. So I didn't go immediately from master's to PhD. Okay. So my master's is a bit fuzzy because I worked before I handed in my master's thesis. Okay. There was a couple of years between finishing my master's and starting up the PhD. Okay. And I did mainly consultancy in that period and mm-hmm. teaching. Okay, cool. And then who did I have to convince? So I had a co-sponsored PhD. So the the authority I work in now actually paid some of the money going ah. into the, yeah. So that's okay. one part I had to convince. And then the university is the other part. And luckily one of my, I had an article coming out, which is now very popular, but you know, but just a published article back then. And Congratulations. That, thank you. And that, that article, when that came out and that was accepted, then the university got much more, much more open to you know, mm-hmm. accepting me as a grad student. Uh, that's often the case, right? You want someone who can demonstrate they have publish. the skills. Yeah, and publish. And that's nice if you know the student can do that beforehand. Yeah, it's, it's very low risk to be like, yeah, oh, yeah, but yeah. we do need yeah. this person to publish out of the PhD. They've already published. I mean, if, if yeah. you already have a published, you you have like a third of your PhD yeah. already done, right? So uh, yeah, yeah, you need three pub- yeah, so you need true. three publications. I've already got one. Hire me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So the risk goes down. So I'm I'm wondering this type of model of doing a PhD where you're sort of already working within a company or within you know a government body and they sort mm-hmm. of sponsor you in part to do a PhD. How popular? Is that because I've I've never heard of that before, but it's very popular okay. in in okay. some universities. Okay. So my university, the university I did my PhD in and my master's in, is a bit different. It's a it's sort of this, one of these seventies universities, you know, very hippie, uh, very real life, very you know, very focused mm. on applying stuff to social issues and issues in you know in the real world so at my university that's that's a very common model so the student works with some organization and because they're both benefiting from that work they're both paying into the uh, the phd at other universities it's less common especially i guess in some disciplines um it's it's much less common and then in some um especially i mean if you move into the more technical fields it's very common uh, Mm -hmm. for engineering and and people in in the more natu- uh, natural science fields, it's yeah. more common. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Within the Netherlands, I can see this for the slightly more technical fields because the PhD would be directly applicable. Mm-hmm. For other fields, I'm not entirely sure how common this is. We have a couple of PhD students in the authority at the moment, so it's it's okay. definitely something that happens. Uh, they're in law, so that's an interesting okay. thing as well, right? They're, they're working as a PhD student at the university, and then. They're helping the authority to, with the knowledge they have and the research skills they have, they're, they're helping them to, for instance, draft new types of laws oh, on spe- spe- very specific fields. So it takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of, you, you need a lot of specialized knowledge to draft these laws. And that goes mm-hmm. hand in hand because the, P, the he, as a PhD, they're studying that exact domain in law. So they, they're sort of really helpful to have them here. My PhD was a bit different, but that's one way it can benefit both. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's no. a cool model for a PhD, almost like, you know, you basically create your own in-house experts. And I, I, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you said this before, it sort of means that you don't have to rely so much on a think tank or, you know, academics situated within a university who have their own sort of agenda and their own motivators as well. Yeah, um, but yeah. It, it's a great model. It helps also, I mean, many people then get the data. Mm. you know with the collaborating organization i did that for the my field research with um, complaint handling i got my data mm. from the authority but it's also i mean it's not completely unproblematic there's a high risk of being sort of a glorified consultant and the, the university is, is typically not very cool with that because then mm. there's a high risk of failure because you don't no. have the time to sort of 
you know, dig deep enough into the to actually the academic discipline and the way of working academically. So there there are risks associated with it as well. But I, I agree with them. No, it's very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So then I, I want to know, so because you, you've done the PhD, you've finished it successfully. Um, no, I, I did. For you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, excellent, excellent. But so how, how did you balance this? Because this, this seems to be quite a big drawback. Because like you said, if you don't manage to balance mm-hmm. this, there is a high chance of failure. So how did you go about this? So one thing is that I had a bit of a, a leg up because I, I already had one published article going in. So that, that left me with sure. a bit less pressure. Mm-hmm. But I tried to think you know, a lot about synergies between the... So for instance, I did a lot of desk research for the authority. And that desk research then okay. played into my article on behavioral market failures. So I always try mm-hmm. to sort of say, if I'm doing stuff, I want to, I wanted to be able to benefit from it both in, in my PhD and, you know, in the authority. And mm-hmm. then I had a, I was able to say no to stuff. I mean, you had to, you, you also need to sort of delimit your role in the organization and say, well, this is what I'm here for and this is what I'm going to do. And I can't do these other things. Mm-hmm. It sounds super interesting but it's just outside the scope of the agreement we're in for this specific PhD. So it also, you, you know, you need to take okay. your battles and preferably take them pretty early. And so that's sort of how I reached that balance and, and got through. But then you must have quite a strong personality. No, uh, no, oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, just, no, okay. No, <laughs> no I, I just have a, I had a PhD advisor who was pretty insistent on, on, I me, see. on, on me working on my academic stuff. So no, no, I, I just had a very strong taskmaster. Yeah. I see. So you, so you, I guess you in that case don't need a no, strong I'm a personality. Push, I, I, I'm a total pushover. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. a terrible thing to say about yourself. Well, at least you were you were surrounded yeah. by a strong well, personality. Yeah, yeah, I was strong. For, it, it, oh, yeah. it totally gives hope to <laughs> the other pushovers listening to this, myself included, that it's possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Find someone who's pushing you in the right direction and then be exactly. a total pushover. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really interested. You sort of mentioned your work on behavioral market failures, but I literally just Googled behavioral market favors and there's no answer <laughs> to what it is that I can find. So Nothing. No, like, no, no. Please. I'll send you my article. But, oh, but, but so, that, yeah. so could you give us, I don't know, a brief breakdown of what yeah. is a behavioral market favor? How does it fit into uh, the sort of the larger work on, on market failures? And yeah, just give us give us a bit of an insight into what this is. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So we can start the other way around. Okay. So a, a traditional market failure is when some constellation in the market, some dynamic creates a suboptimal outcome for the people participating in the marketplace. So th- that's the consumers, right? That's typically um, externalities is a very common market failure that you know the, the entire cost of some action is not being borne by the company, it's not being borne by the consumer, so it's being borne by the society at large. The society has sort of a mandate then to go in and regulate and pollution is a very mm. a common example of this. And a behavioral market failure is very similar. It's when some dynamic in the market is not benefiting the participants. It, it's often benefiting the companies. So a very extreme example of this is, for instance, payday loans can be, can be, and I'm qualify that by saying it can be, mm-hmm. behavior market failure where people, because of some psychological tendencies, some behavioral tendencies, they cannot foresee the consequences of their actions. Mm-hmm. They over borrow and then the cost of that is then transmitted to society because they, for instance, lose that job or they're not able to take care of their family or they're not able to to sort of live their life as a as a, as a citizen and with the obligations and responsibilities that that comes with so then they transmit costs to society and the only one who's winning in this case is the company who's not bearing all those costs so the question is is this a market failure in a similar sense as pollution is and it comes down to how well people make these purchasing decisions for payday loans, if that's the case, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of, I mean, a lot of research, George Lernstein, for instance, a lot of his research demonstrates that that's probably not the case and that there are real consequences and real costs of this. And that as a society, we probably, we would be better off by regulating these and putting limits to how people interact or transmitting some of the costs to those who are supplying the products. Mm-hmm. So that's one example of, of a behavioral market failure. Other examples include, that's where it gets more complicated, 
but it includes how companies provide information to consumers. So if we have consumers with limited capability of consuming information or, mm -hmm. or handling information, mm -hmm. then their ability to choose products across the market is very limited depending on what type of information is in the market. If that information is complicated, if it's too complex, then their ability to select goes down and then competition in the market goes down as well. And then there might be, some research indicates there might be equilibria where companies push out very complex information and there's mm -hmm. no one competing on that aspect. They're not competing mm -hmm. to push, to, you know, to create simpler information because all of these companies are profiting from an equilibrium where information is very difficult for the consumer to engage with. So that's a, a situation where competition alone is not solving the problem, but there is an mm -hmm. obvious problem. It's very difficult for the consumer to navigate and consumers are losing. Companies are winning because competition pressure goes down. So the, mm -hmm. the question is, in this case, is it justified for the for an authority, for instance, or for the for the state to mandate how information mm -hmm. should look? So obviously that's mm -hmm. a that's an interference with how the free market works. But is that interference justified? Right. And again, it depends on how, how well do consumers navigate? What types of consumers suffer from this? Uh, mm -hmm. What are their options? And as with market failures in general, what are the mark, what does the product look like? What role does the product play in their life? Stuff like that. So okay. in, in, in my research, I try to sit down. And, so there's a lot of, you can find a lot of people might, might, might not call it behavioral market failures. But in the literature, there's a lot of examples where we justify regulation because of right. behavioral outcomes. So consumers have a difficulty here. Let's 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 regulate. Yeah. Yeah. What I did is I said that's probably not the best way to create regulation. So this type of ad hoc regulation creates a mm -hmm. lot of problems. It, it lends itself to regulatory capture. It lends itself to uh, it, it decreases companies' ability to navigate in the future because they never know if something that they're developing is going to be, so let's say you're you're designing a new loan. Mm -hmm. You don't know if that loan is going to survive if you know if it's not very transparent what's allowed and what's yeah. not allowed in yeah. the marketplace. So what what I tried is I said what what could be a framework for this? But given what we know now, what could a framework for behavioral market failures look like? And I created a sort of a transactional approach where I looked, let's regulate based on how com how consumers buy stuff, not what they buy, but how they buy it. Mm -hmm. That was my research idea. And then I said there's different ways of buying stuff. And uh, these ways lend themselves to exploitation in different ways. Mm -hmm. For instance, subscriptions or continued payment yeah. types. Mm -hmm. That's one way of buying stuff where your ability to be consistently aware of the costs is very important. And mm -hmm. if you're not very aware of the cost, then companies can extract rent in a sense by, you know, by exploiting your inattention mm -hmm. to running costs. Uh, so that's one way and with one type of problem. And then there's one type of solution to that. And my idea was to create this framework. So it became entirely transparent. If we adopted it, it became entirely transparent for companies to say, if, if we go down this route, then we're going to end up in a behavioral market failure situation and we're going to be regulated. So let's put our development resource into something different. Because that's not allowed. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I wanted to create a system that allowed companies to forecast and be able to navigate in the future what types of regulation they would encounter in yeah. in this domain. I I love this. This is almost like a decision tree of cho choose your own adventure. Be like either yeah. I invest <laughs> in this or three yeah. routes, like three branches down the line. I'm in a regulated market. I don't want that. So backtrack. It's very game theoretical. I quite like it. In my paper, I had a I had a, some, some scenarios where I said, imagine you go to a company and you say, I have this great investment idea. There are only two companies in the market, so I want to lend you money so you can buy up your competitor, and then you you're then a dominating force in the market, right? You're mm. A monopoly. Yes. But you would never do that because you know if you're a monopoly, you're going to get regulated. Yes. So that's not something you would you wouldn't invest your resources to go down that route. Mm -hmm. But if I say I have this great investment idea, I've developed an algorithm that can detect when people are intoxicated. So I want you to use that algorithm to sell them payday loans. No, oh, excellent. Is that allowed? No. Or not? Well, it probably would be. Yeah. Uh... There's no specific laws that uh, maybe there are, maybe there aren't. And the, that's the problem, right? When when you have this sort of, when it's not clear to the companies if it's allowed or not, then they don't know if they should invest their money yeah, there true. or not. And it, it creates a lot of uncertainty. 
Mm. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I wanted to create a system that it sort of made that uncertainty go away. Wow, very impressive. It's super interesting. I'm wondering, is there, when you talk about defining a behavioral market failure, is there sort of a threshold of severity that you use? Like, for example, could you imagine that a company who asks for your email and uses sort of an opt-in, opt-out box to then send you marketing constantly, mm -hmm. you know, and that causes some slight annoyance to the customer, but on a large scale, would that be considered a behavioral market failure or not within your framework? So I, this is this is another thing I think often goes wrong when people discuss market failures mm -hmm. and behavioral market failures. Even if you have a, so traditional competition theory that's very clear it's very clear when something's a problem yeah. that's pretty clear within you know traditional competition policy but it's always you know whenever you have a, a specific instance of competition problems then there's always some analysis going into that it's never just it's not something you just decide on it's something that needs analysis and needs to have a an analytical startup before you start deciding how to solve the problem mm. and i think the same goes into behavioral market failures mm. it's you have the limits but the limits takes some analysis to decide whether it's on one side of the fence or another side of the fence and in this case it comes down to what's the value being added and that's that's an important question is this solving anything for anyone or is it simply a problem for everyone even though it's a small cost problem is it is it a just an annoyance or is it actually creating value that's the analysis that needs to go in. And then you're saying, is it problematic given the framework? Yes or no? If yes, is the value being added? Mm. Is that more value than it detracts? So right. is more value being created or is more value being taken away, right? That's the analysis. It's very similar to when companies okay. merge, for instance. You ask, is, there, is the production, is the added flexibility of production, is that over, does that outweigh the risk of a monopoly situation or market power? So it's always it's always a specific analysis, but there are clear boundaries for what we will accept and what we won't. Right. Okay. So how does this then relate to sludge? Because I, I mean, one of the, the key things that you've mentioned is how information is presented to customers, especially if it's in the market in which information in the most untransparent mm -hmm. way is just being thrown at the customers. I know within the financial sector specifically, which is what I specialize in, there is a lot of this. This is essentially called like over disclosure. Like you're throwing so much disclosure at me. I've got mm -hmm. no idea where I'm supposed to be looking. So I know there is several uh, financial institutions who do apply behavioral science that want to get away from this form of information distribution because it doesn't actually benefit anyone involved, neither yeah. the company nor the customer. But very often this over disclosure is just referred to as a sludge. But would you say that then it's more likely to be a behavioral market failure. Does hmm. sludge feed into behavioral market failures? Is there a clear distinction? Or am I just barking up completely the wrong tree? Am I in like the wrong forest, maybe even? No, I think it, so I think it makes sense. That I think the problem, it comes down to how we define sludge. And I know people, sure. you know, that's, an, that's a dis discussion, you know, that could take the rest of the podcast. But <laughs> in my mind, sludge is, and I, as a philosopher, I hate that because it's, that's not important. The important thing is what we can agree on. But mm -hmm. it's sludge is an unnecessarily complicated complication in a process added either with intent or unintentionally, but that has the character, the quality that it sort of curbs or limits behavior within the system. And I think sludge, much of what we see in, in financial disclosure is sludge because it's mm -hmm. it's a drag on consumers that's not benefiting them and it's overcomplicated as you mentioned the question is is if it's intentional or not sure and i think that's a big question i think a lot of people assume that financial institutions make these forms and disclosures overly complicated but i'm not really sure that's the case i have a different sort of theory that financial disclosures today is what happens when you make when you use legal scholars as UX experts. That's basically mm -hmm. what UX looks like for someone who has a legal background. Right? <laughs> and and pro the problem is that financial companies have no incentive investing UX or sort of user research into that part of their business. They don't care about these because these are documents, you know, they're being mandated to give them to the consumers. They have no real incentive in creating more transparency. They're, they're not sort of making it overly complicated 
that's not their intention, but they don't care whether it is or not. So they they just go down to legal and say, you know, draft these documents, and they the documents are what looks what documents look like when you make you know legal workers create them. That's yeah. my theory, at least. So I think whether the sludge or not depends on whether you you think sludge is something that's intentionally created to curb behavior or not. I see. So it's at a market failure. It can be if it limits competition and if competition is not able to solve the problem. And I think that's probably true in many cases. It's very difficult for consumers to navigate the market. The question is, is it the right market failure to work with? And that's a that's a different question because it basically, when you get these types of documents, you're already very far in your decision process. And the question is whether how, even if you understood these documents very well, the question is how likely is it you would switch to a competition to a competitor and i think that that's probably not very likely very interesting no very very interesting uh yeah please do send us uh your paper i'd be very very happy to read it sure uh, I, I find this type of stuff fascinating i do have to say so this is the stuff that you've done in your phd and as sponsored by both the university and the authority mm -hmm. Was it a very smooth transition going from that then for into the authority full time? Was there <laughs> a, a vast transition period? Mm. Or how different was it? So I think it, it was different. And I think the greatest difference is one of the strongest qualities of being in academia. And I mean, there's a lot of drawbacks. So, <laughs> But one of the biggest benefits is that you're completely free to think whatever you like and follow that thought you know, for whatever period of time you want. And that's such an amazing gift. You know, there's no other place in the world where that's how you work. Sit down, sure. have a thought, follow that thought, create, you know, create uh, hypotheses, create experiments based on that. And that's obviously not how an, an organizational or a political organization works. We're given agendas to work with. Mm -hmm. We're also able to propose agendas, but they're then either accepted or not. So. We are given problems. We're not told how to solve them, but we're given problems and then asked to solve them. So consumers have problems navigating green claims. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. So how do you want to test this? How do you want to work on it? And then it doesn't really matter how much I, I'm, I'm interested in green claims or you know that particular domain of, of the market, but that's just what I'm working with, right? So mm -hmm. that is different, but I mean, I'm still very privileged. Uh, I'm giving freedom of methodology, and that's that's also very rare. Mm -hmm. And I have an organization with, as political organizations have, they have a lot of power. So my ability to make positive changes in the world is much larger now than they were as an academic. And unless you're Cass Sunstein or Richard Thaler, I think it's always going to be the case <laughs> that the you, the power you have within inside an, a political organization is much bigger. It's much more directly applicable to the world than the power you have as an academic. So that's also a, a huge privilege, something you, know, you need to be very happy for, but also it's it's something you should take care of and, and work mm -hmm. with, you know, with care. Yeah, absolutely. So from that reasoning and that experience onwards, did you ever consider staying in academia when you started a PhD or were you like, nah? Uh, <laughs> I always said that if New York University would call me, then I, I would definitely stay. But, <laughs> but that was not the case. Okay. Um, that, that is unfortunate. <laughs> that is unfortunate. I had a really good time as a PhD student. I really what one of the things I enjoyed the most and that I miss the most is other PhD students and taking graduate courses. And I mean, it's the first time as a student I thought. To be, I, I experienced myself being surrounded by people who really, who were really interested in what they work with. Even as a master's student, that that was never really my my experience. So it's mm. something I really miss. But I get, I don't have the temperament to work the, the, as slowly as you do in academia. Nicely put. And and yeah, and I don't have the personality for internal uh, university squabbles. That's the, <laughs> I guess that's the best way of putting it. And uh, that's, I mean, that that's a lot, right? So power dynamics between professors and stuff like that. That's simply, it's not something I'm used, I'm not used to it and I, I can't accommodate it. So I was also in that sense, happy to, you know, to get out of the university, which, you know, from the perspective of some, a place you work is yeah. very odd, right? It's a very odd place full of very ancient ways of doing stuff. So, so I was also happy to come to a, you know, very modern institution, which, the authority is so 
it's not very top down it's a very it's a thinking place and a, a place you know where there's room to to have a, an opinion but within a professional yeah. in, in a professional way right that was so di- so diplomatic I have to say, such a diplomatic way of yeah, very yeah. diplomatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no, we know exactly what absolutely. you're talking about. I think, yeah, I yeah, wink, we, wink. Can, we yeah. can see through the diplomatic lines there. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, um. <laughs> but I, I love working with academics, and I, I have the, I have the fortune of of being able to do that in my job, and and then uh, also I have the fortune of of being able to not work with them uh, at some point. So that's that's the great fortunes of my job, and. And um, and other people fit more naturally into an academic environment, and and I, I respect that. Yeah, that that's very fair. So you've been at the authority for a couple of years now. You said I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you see the the next five years develop for you? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> it I guess it depends on where this is going. Fair. In Europe, uh, I know about the US, but in Europe, that's a there's a big push for more of my type in policymaking. I'm meeting more and more civil servants who, who have the same type of agenda in their organization as we have in, in mine, or I mm-hmm. have with my colleagues in mind. So I think it's a really interesting time. It's sort of, even though we've been discussing, you know, nudging and behavioral economics and behavioral science for years in policymaking, this is, in my experience, it's the first time you're seeing people working with this as their specific agenda and in a respected way within the organization. So I'm very keen to what's going to happen with the policymaking in the next five years. Uh, and I'm really hoping to be a part of that process because I think so far we've been called in and asked to solve old problems with new tools. And mm-hmm. we, what we really want to do is solve new problems with new tools, right? And de- yeah. be a part of defining what, what problems are. And I think in, in consumer policy and health policy and social policies, there's a lot of old ways of thinking about problems that could be updated with what we now know about human behavior. So I'm hopefully, I'm definitely hoping the next five years is going to be in policy because I think it's going to be an interesting place. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I, I share the same aspirations for the field of policy. I do think that this was an incredibly insightful episode. I feel like we've got a whole history of you and your work and mm-hmm. just sort of professional life in 40 <laughs> minutes i'm not sure how you feel about that <laughs> it was a pleasure yeah it's so rare you get to talk about yourself there yeah. you go the final question of course if the listener wants to i don't know find out more about your work and what you're doing you know is there any place that you can send them or anything you want to just plug anything at all this is your moment to do it oh uh, i will <laughs> so we dedicate a lot of time into publishing our results so it's a mm. It's a huge thing being transparent about our work and how, mm-hmm. you know, how do we reach certain policy conclusions? So go check out our website. You can see all the publications we do, which I think is really interesting, especially if you're interested in sort of the practical applications of a lot of this research and, you know, how do policymakers think about it and how do they apply it? I think it's interesting for, for your listeners. So Absolutely. Thank you very much. Go check we'll it out. make sure it's linked mm-hmm. below to reduce yeah. as much friction as possible sure. uh, for, for the listeners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So that was our conversation with Andreas. I thought it was fascinating, super cool to speak to someone who is doing research and sort of, you know, behavioral engineering projects within the Danish uh, Competition and Consumer Authority and a really cool like journey into the PhD and experience. It was amazing, I think, to speak to someone who had a PhD was funded right by the authority to go and work in the authority after you finished the PhD. It's a really cool model and uh, yeah. I'm glad we got to talk about it. Yeah, no, I, I think it's an interesting model. I, I wish there were more of them. I think I would have loved to have been funded. Well, given my topic of research, I would have been have I would have had to be funded by a financial institution, but quite frankly, I wouldn't have minded. I would argue. <laughs> I wouldn't have minded at all. No, I think this this type of model of a PhD is is particularly interesting for people who do want to do a PhD, do want to have that type of research experience and that type of training, but know for a fact that they will always want to apply their research to direct problems, aim for immediate impact, aim for immediate problem solution, and just, I guess, slightly more practical, maybe even more pragmatic people that don't really want to seek out knowledge for the sake of knowledge, 
but want to seek out knowledge because here's a problem. Now let's aim to fix it, which I think fits my personality quite well. Some some people might absolutely hate this. Some people might hate the idea of, well, the only reason I'm doing this research is because someone is issuing me to do this research and we're only helping this company solve their issues and, and that's as far as it'll, it'll go. I can understand that side as well. But I, I think it sounds dope. Honestly, I think it's a dope way of doing a PhD. In hindsight, yeah. I would love to have signed up, but I'm not Danish. I'm not entirely sure when I would have heard about this opportunity. <laughs> but right. it does sound cool. It does sound really cool. I, I agree. And interesting model of just sort of, you know, investing in creating your own in-house experts mm. and how this removes the need for, you know, people within government bodies to have to collaborate with academics working in universities and sort of overcome differences in incentive structures and differences mm. in communication styles and priorities. It's a really interesting model. And uh, and yeah, and, and another philosopher working in behavioral science. So we get yep. to add that to our philosopher repertoire um, <laughs> on the podcast. Yeah. We love them. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's always interesting to see a philosopher or an engineer make it into behavioral science. I find it really interesting when, when they end up. I do think yeah. they, they add a very interesting perspective to the field, which, I mean, the field can always use more interesting perspectives. So, uh, but yeah, especially philosophers and engineers, I enjoy when they end up in behavioral science. I don't know why them particularly, but I just mm. always really, <laughs> maybe it's just only the nice people in engineering and philosophy end up in behavioral science. So they like, they, they lift up the average. <laughs> There's some like weird selection. Yeah. Going on here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, no, it was awesome. And we will make sure to link everything to Andreas below. So if you are interested in getting in contact or you want to sort of read up a little bit more about uh, what he's doing, then yeah, we'll definitely link his his Twitter and anything else that he mentioned. And yeah, thanks again for listening, guys. We hope this was an enjoyable episode. We hope you enjoyed hearing about, you know, Andreas and his point of view and his experience. We definitely did. Uh, we enjoyed it. So that's all that matters. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we now want industry funded PhDs, but it's a bit too late. <laughs> a little oh, bit too well, late. It is, it is what it is. Anyway, guys, thanks so much for listening. As always, we hope you have a good week and we hope to see you again next week. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the one to love, you're the one to 